Well, good morning. Question for you today. Have you ever struggled with endurance in the Christian life? Some of us. Perhaps you're dry in your Christian walk and you feel like you're running on fumes spiritually. Um, or maybe you find yourself in a struggle with sin that just never seems to end. Um, just, just a battle with sin. Perhaps you're here and you've never even trusted in Christ. Um, maybe you don't even understand Christianity or, or why people follow Christ. Um, so my prayer for you this morning is that this passage will help you to see the person of Christ, whether it's the first time or more clearly, as we see three movements or points in the text of Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 11. And those would be the submission of the servant, the vindication of the servant, and the admonition of the servant. And I've titled this sermon, The Submission and Call of the Servant. So please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50, and we'll be reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. text says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I would turn not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheek to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me, and therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. That's the word of God. So sobering words today. Um, flip over to Isaiah chapter 1. Just introduce the passage here. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Isaiah says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So Isaiah we see was written by a prophet, same name, Isaiah, some of Amos, and his reign, or his ministry rather, spans spans the reign of four Judean kings. He lists them there, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So this is a period of about 50 to 55 years. It's quite quite a long prophetic ministry. It was written in a time when the countries to the north of of Judah, which were Samaria, if you remember, Um, The ten northern tribes of Israel split away from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin after Solomon. And so the the northern kingdom of Samaria and also Syria were hostile toward Judah, and they planned to overthrow King Ahaz and replace him with a king that would be obedient to them. The Assyrian Empire, which was further north than that, um, up in the region of what we would think of modern-day Turkey and further east. They were dominating the area during this time, and the kings of Judah were sometimes allied either with or against Assyria. And at one point, they were trying to use the power of Assyria against closer enemies. At another point, they feared the power, the brutality brutality of Assyria, and they were looking for allies in Egypt. So you have Judah, this little tiny country that's surrounded by a bunch of idolatrous neighbors. And Isaiah indicts them, he condemns them, because they fell into the sins of their neighbors. They fell into the sins of idolatry. They were hypocritical in their obedience of God's law. They claimed to be 
Yahweh followers, but they syncretize their worship of God with their worship of idols. They were proud, and they did not treat the poor and widows justly. We see that in a number of passages in Isaiah. So Isaiah's original audience was the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah, as we see in one one here. And the book of Isaiah was written to condemn Judah for her sin, promise judgment for Judah and for all the nations that were around her, and also promise ultimate restoration and blessing through the suffering, exaltation, and final rule of the Messiah. We see that in a number of passages in the both halves of the book. The first half of the book, chapters 1 to 39, is focused on judgment of Judah and the other nations. The second half of the book focuses more on the hope and redemption that's to come. So you um, ultimately, that's bound up in the Messiah. So we, we see, starting in chapter 40, chapter 42, chapter 43, 49, 50, 52 to 53, um, Isaiah 61, there's a number of passages that talk about the Messiah. Um, the passage of, that we're looking at today, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9, 4 through 11, is the second half, it's, it's the third of four or five um, servant songs are oracles that speak of the coming Messiah. So let's look at our first point this morning, which is the submission of the servant. The submission of the servant. Verse 4 says, The Lord God has given me, if we get back to Isaiah 50, verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. So, this is the same servant that was in Isaiah 42 and will be again in Isaiah 52 to 53. God gave the tongue of the taught, or literally of disciples is what the text says, to the servant. It was a gift for the purpose, he says, of benefiting others. What is the tongue of disciples? So disciples were those who learned from others. They served others, and the word implies humility, obedience, and a desire to take in wisdom from others. What was the purpose of the tongue that was given? Literally, it means to sustain or to bend others. That's what that verb means. So for the weary or bent, they would literally be unbent by the word of the servant. His ear was also opened to hear as a disciple, The servant was a disciple of God himself. And remember that the Messiah ultimately had disciples of his own, and they were to learn from him. But this passage says that our Lord was a disciple himself. Who was he a disciple of? His father. The text says that morning by morning he was awakened or stirred, and his ear was stirred to hear as a disciple. So God opened his ear, and we'll see God also gave him the ear of a disciple. To have the ear of a disciple means to hear God's word and respond. It also is a call to obedience. So the servant uniquely, perfectly obeyed the voice of the Lord God. Let's look at verse 5. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. So again, having the ear of the disciple opened by the Lord, Yahweh, the servant, himself was not disobedient, did not turn back. The literal phrase shows a, maybe a more of an emphasis. It literally is backwards, I did not turn back. He was obedient to the voice of the Lord God and did not turn away. Submission is not something that's forced, it's voluntary. The servant wasn't forced, um, but he obeyed. The servant just demonstrated submission and obeyed the voice of Yahweh. He did not turn back. Let's read verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Instead of turning back, he gave his back for striking. He gave his cheeks or jaws for plucking. His face was available for insults and spittle. So if, you, if you're familiar with it all with the, the ancient Near East, the beard was a sign of dignity. And so in 2 Samuel 10, when 
the king of Moab shaved half of David's emissaries' beards off. They were ashamed. They were too ashamed to return home. So they went to Jericho to let their beards re- regrow. Here the servant does not turn back, but instead he offers his back for striking and his beard for plucking. The tearing out of a beard would leave one disfigured. The insult of having a beard removed was coupled with pain and permanent scars, and the blows to the back could leave one permanently disabled. The plucking of the beard was accompanied by blows, insults, and spit. So he did not conceal his face, he gave his face, he offered his face, or he, he, he revealed his face for insults and spittle. The pain of both hair torn out of the face and blows to the back would be accompanied by the pain of insults and spittle. The servant does not turn back, but he offers his back and his face for these attacks. His call of discipleship by the Lord God includes obedience to the pain of rejection and insult, as well as the physical pain of tearing the, of the beard and blows to the back. Let's look at our second point. This morning, the vindication of the servant. The vindication of the servant. Verse 7, But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. There's a word play here in the language. I think the ESV does capture it somewhat. The servant says that the Lord God helps me and I will not be put to shame or disgraced. And you can see if you look back to verse 6, there's a, a noun called with disgrace or insult. It's the same word in, in the language. And here it's repeated as the verb. So even though the servant does not conceal his face from insults or disgrace, he will not be affected by those insults. They will not pe- penetrate him because he has set his face like flint. If you know anything about flint, it's a hard, brittle rock they use it for and have used it for thousands of years for tools, for arrowheads, axe heads, spearheads, and also for starting, spi- for starting fires. Um, it produces sparks when it's struck. Though the servant's face outwardly would be disfigured by the ripping of the beard and blows, yet he was steeled against turning back. Obedient suffering was the call of the servant, and he would not be swayed from his course. The temptation to retaliate in kind or to fall this despair would not cause him or succeed in causing him to sin because he was resolute against his own temptation. It's not that the temptation didn't exist, but he steeled his face against it. Because of God's help to him, He has the knowledge that he will not be ashamed. No matter what others will do or say to him, he has a stronger ally and a stronger resolution than the attacks against him. Um, He has the confidence in the worst of moments that their insults and attacks will not cause him to sin, but that he will complete the task set before him without embarrassment, regret, blame, or remorse. He will not be put to shame, whatever insults come, and he will not be ashamed of his own behavior or demeanor. Notice the gifts of the Lord, Yahweh, here to the servant. He gives the tongue of the disciple. He awakens or stirs the servant morning by morning. He opens the ear to hear as a disciple. He helps the servant. Notice the response of the servant. The servant doesn't disobey, but he gives obedience. He doesn't turn back, but he gives his back for striking. He doesn't hide his face, but he gives his, his jaws for tearing out the beard and for insults and spittle. The servant responds to the call and gifts of the Lord with perfect submission, obedience, into suffering. He gives himself. Let's look at verse 8. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. The servant knows that in the midst of this great physical and spiritual trial, his vindication is near. He will be vindicated by God himself, and thus no one can rightly accuse him. He challenges those who would quarrel or take suit against him to bring their case. He is confident that they will fail because of the one who stands with him and because of his own resolution to obey the voice of the Lord God. The second couplet in this verse says literally, Who is the master or the Baal? Who is the master of my judgment? Let him draw near to me. So the challenger to the servant would have to demonstrate the guilt of the servant 
to be the master of his judgment. And the servant knows that his own conduct will be blameless and that the accusations will not stand because he has a true master of his judgment. And the true master of his judgment has given him the ear of a disciple and he will be obedient. He will not turn back. Let's read verse 9. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The servant declares again that the Lord God will help him. And he looks around to see who can declare him guilty. Rightly. He says that all those who do so will literally fall apart. A garment that is moth-eaten is full of holes. It lacks integrity. It has no strength. There's no strength of their arguments. None can legitimately declare the servant guilty. He is in the right. He has been obedient to the Lord, and he's received physical and verbal strikes and insults without any cause. No one can declare him guilty, and thus all the things he suffered are undeserved. Those who might accuse him literally fall apart. Their arguments are vanity and moth-eaten. God's help is to the servant. Even though insulted, these insults will not affect him. Even though others mock him, he will not be disgraced. He stiffens or hardens himself like flint, not against God and his goodness, but against the temptation to fail, like to turn back, to reject God's call upon him, and even against the despair from the insults and the mocking. As he sets his face like flint, he knows that he will not be ashamed because the Lord God will help him The expression here, behold, means look, pay attention. He tells this to himself and his listeners. Pay attention, God will help me. Look, those who declare me guilty or condemn me, they will all wear out like a garment, moth-eaten. This makes me think of Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27 says this, Of old, the Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. The heavens and the earth will wear out like a garment, the psalmist says, and God will change them, but God will endure. The servant says that these who declare him guilty will likewise wear out like a garment, moth-eaten, but he will endure. What happens when moths eat a garment? It literally falls apart. So it will be for those who condemn the servant. Let's look at our third and final point. The admonition of the servant. The admonition of the servant. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Who among you is fearful of Yahweh, literally. Um, the, the address changes to speaking to the hearers and asks, who fears God? We know from many passages in the Old Testament that this is a reference to faith. And we can see that in the second couplet where it, re- it references trusting in the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Fear of God is equated with faith in Him. But, Verse 10 parallels listening to the voice of his servant with fearing God. In other words, the one who fears God listens to the voice of his servant. Remember that this voice comes from the the tongue of a disciple who would sustain or unbend the weary with a word. God-fearers will listen to the servant, and he says that they will trust in the Lord, Yahweh. He adds one more couplet issuing a repentance, a call to repentance for his hearers, The ones walking in darkness and not light should trust in Yahweh and lead on God. The Lord will sustain the God-fearer who trusts in him just as the servant will sustain the weary one with a word. So the one who walks in darkness and not light should turn to the one true light, God himself, and lean on him because the one who fears God will also listen to the voice of his servant. Let's look at verse 11. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. 
So verse 11 speaks of those kindling fire and torches, which literally is fire arrows in the language, that are girded on or put on. The self-ruled one is trusting himself and his own fire that he's kindled. His fire arrows that he has to defend himself with and perhaps terrify others. Pride has set him up to imagine he's invincible. Fire arrows are kindled and put on as weapons, ready to use the fires at hand to rekindle any arrows. These individuals are not walking in the light of the servant, but they in the light of their own fire or in the shine of their own fire. These individuals use fire as a weapon and trusted in it. They walked in the shine of their own fire and they used the fire arrows that they kindled. They're self-contented and satisfied with their own military prowess. They need no victory from God because they believe that they can bring about that victory on their own. To them, the warning comes that their self-reliance and rebellion will receive something from his hand. They will lie down or sleep in torment or pain. Those who kindle fires, who trust in the fire arrows that they produce and who live in the light of their own fire, their own glory, well, who trust in themselves and live for their own fire, they will receive torment when they lie down. It's a euphemism for death. So the servant's message is that he has been obedient as a disciple to God. He gave his back for striking. He gave his cheeks for plucking. His face for insults and spittle. He was unashamed because he was innocent of all wrong. No one could rightly condemn him, and thus he suffered without any wrongdoing of his own. The ones who fear or trust God will listen to his voice, and those who walk in darkness are called to come out and trust in God. Those who make their own light via fire, who use the power they have and live for themselves apart from God. They have their own light. These ones will lie down in torment. When they die, there's torment or pain. The servant's discipleship led to his suffering, which leads to his call to trust and warning of judgment for those who reject his call. So who was this servant? It couldn't have been any of the prophets Um, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, they all sinned. They all sometimes turned back. Only one was called to and fulfilled obedient suffering. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. John 8.29 says this, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John 10, 17 to 18, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Remember, the disciple, had the, he had the ear of the disciple, and he did not turn back. The tongue of the disciple means that he is also one of us. He had to be a disciple to represent the disciples and humble himself to live and die for us. If we look at the New Testament, we see a servant who was wakened morning by morning by God. He was given the ear of a disciple. Mark 1.35 says this, In the early morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. We see a servant who had the tongue of a disciple to sustain the weary one with a word. In John 6.35, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. In John 7.37, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Or in Matthew 11.28-30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. From I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The weary ones, the bent ones, he would unbend with a word. The servant was given the tongue of the disciple. With his ear opened as a disciple, he was not disobedient. He did not turn back. Contrast with his own disciples. Remember Matthew 26. Jesus, in verse 55, it says, At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. Verse 56, But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. 
He gave his back for striking. He gave his cheeks for plucking. He did not hide his face from insults and spittle. We read in Matthew 26, verse 67, Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him. Chapter 27, verse 26, Then then Pilate released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. He gave his back for striking. Verse 27, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, took the reed, and began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. This servant set his face like flint toward his mission. In Luke 9.51, it says that he set his face to go toward Jerusalem. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was not going to be dissuaded from his mission. Um, He was... uh, resolute in his purpose. He steeled himself, even though he knew, and it seems that he was the only one who knew what was coming. The other, his disciples didn't really understand. And when he told them, they tried to stop him. This servant associates his own words with the fear of God. John 5.22 says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. This servant calls upon people to trust in God and warns those who do not of coming judgment. John 8, 23 Jesus was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are from this world or of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world." Jesus would judge, and Jesus would also condemn them um, because they would die in their sins. The servant perfectly fulfilled the discipleship that his own followers failed. He submitted himself fully to the will of the Father. Is that reason for discouragement for you today, or for me today, as we see ourselves in our own imperfect obedience If it is, then remember what he accomplished on your behalf. Listen to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2 verse 10. And in him you've been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions and having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So you and I, if you are a believer today, you are in Christ, and his victory is your victory. His vindication came in his resurrection. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the Spirit, or by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Romans 8.11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
The vindication came in the resurrection. It was the demonstration of his righteousness. Um, He was vindicated by the Holy Spirit as he was raised from the dead. He was vindicated, although he, he suffered as if he was not innocent, he was innocent. He was in the place, he suffered in the place of those who were not innocent. He suffered in our place. In Isaiah 50, verse 8, he says, He who vindicates me is near, literally near to me my justice or my, judge, my righteousness. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. His confidence lies in his goodness. We don't have a confidence based on our goodness. We have a confidence based on his goodness. We've been reckoned righteous because of his perfect goodness. He was innocent, condemned for us, and his confidence, is not, his confidence in not being condemned extends to us because of his work. So if you are a believer in Christ today, you belong to him, and you have been made complete in Christ. You are in Christ if you are a believer. Romans 6 says that when he died to sin, you died to sin, that you might live to righteousness and serve it. In Isaiah 50, verse 9, he says, Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them like a garment will wear out. The moth will eat them up. He deserved no condemnation. He was innocent and would stand up against every accuser, yet he was condemned for us in our place. Romans 8 1 to 4 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for the ones who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, the ones who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Christ was condemned on our behalf. He was condemned for sin in the flesh. God condemned sin in the flesh when he condemned sin that was reckoned to the Son of God. Our sin was condemned in him so that we might not be condemned. The servant asked the question in Isaiah 50 verse 9, Who will condemn me? Who will declare me guilty? We can ask the same question now as well. Romans 8.34 says this, Who is he who condemns. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who even now is interceding for us. Because we're in Christ, we can ask the same question, and no one can declare us guilty because the goodness of Christ, his perfection, has been reckoned to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might be, become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 4, 22, Therefore it was also credited to him as righteousness, to Abraham, it's speaking of there. Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to Abraham, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he, was who, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So brothers and sisters, how should we respond Remember his love. Remember what he accomplished for us. When you fail by sinning or discouraged by previous failures in sin, remember that God has fully satisfied his own wrath against your sin by pouring out his wrath upon his son. You stand uncondemned, justified, and yet called to live a life of holiness and sanctification because of his purchase of you. God is holy. He calls his children to be holy. He calls you on to run the race of sanctification, what is the final destination? What is our motivation? What is our empowerment? Hebrews 12, 2 says that we run the race looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. How do Christians who are dry, who are weak, who who have not, who don't feel empowered, how do we gain new strength? How do we gain new motivation? The Hebrews writer says that we do it by looking to Christ. We look to Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He has brought us out of darkness to trust in the Lord God and to lean upon him, as Isaiah 50, verse 10, that we read. We are now fearing and trusting in God. We hear the voice of his servant. 
Jesus is the one we heed and we look to him. His sacrificial work, his full payment for us, which dwelling upon fills us with gratitude, producing love for him and others, and his example, which we desire to faithfully follow. If you're feeling dry in your spiritual walk, or you're feeling weak, if you're struggling with sin, remember the servant who, without any cause for accusation, took the blows, the plucking, the insults that we deserve. He took the wrath we deserve in order that we might hear his voice, trust in him, and walk from darkness into light. His goodness and his kindness in his work for us is the reason we love him. And it's also a motivation and empowerment to love others even in the face of our own mocking, insults, and spittle. We can set our face like flint for following Jesus against our own sin because Jesus died for us and rose again. And we can live and overcome because he has brought us out of darkness by his power, by his grace, into the light of himself. If you don't know him today, know that Jesus stands and offers grace to you. It's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot bribe the judge of the universe. But it's a free gift for all who call upon him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus has taken the condemnation we deserve. We can have full and free forgiveness for every sin, the promise of eternal life. Um, He died for us. His death, death on the cross fully absolved us of guilt because Jesus took our place. And he rose from the dead on the third day, forever defeating death. Jesus says in John 3, 14, Just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John six forty. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son or looks on the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus said in John eleven thirty five, 35, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? The finality of death has been destroyed through the work of Christ. But remember the warning as well. The ones who walk in the light of their own fire, who kindle fire arrows and live for their own light, who oppose God's authority and ignore God's goodness, both in creation and in the gospel, they will receive a judgment from the servant. Sin earns judgment from God. Remember, Acts 17 says that God has uh, called or commanded all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And he says he's given this He's given this seal for him by raising him from the dead. So the sign that Jesus was raised from the dead is not only of great comfort, but it's also, um, it's also a mark of judgment for the world. Romans 2.4 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Hebrews 10.31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, don't neglect so great a salvation. There is only this moment that we have promised. So in conclusion, remember, remember the example of the servant. Remember the work of the servant on our behalf. Remember the call of the servant to listen and his warning to those who trust in themselves. Life in Christ is empowered by his work for his glory, and every believer in this room will see him. Keep running the race. Keep setting your face like flint against your own sin and the temptation that comes, and set your face toward Christ. Resolute, Be resolutely looking to Jesus. Keep the tongue of a disciple that sustains the weary with the word. How do we get, how do we get to that point? We need to look to Christ. We look to his example. We look to God's word and we're changed through it. Christ, the suffering and glorified servant, his grace is sufficient to use our weak frames for his glory and he will bring us through. His person and work is sufficient to save us and transform us. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It 
start in verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So transformation comes through looking upon the glory of Christ through his word. Look through his example. First Peter chapter 2 says, Christ gave us an example that we should walk in his steps. He saved us and he was also our example. We can follow in his footsteps. Always looking to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a a good and kind God, Lord, and you have done great things, Lord. You have brought us out of darkness, Lord, into your light. Lord, it's by your spirit, by your grace that we're saved. Lord, I, I thank you for the work of your servant, of your son, Lord, who was humbly obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that you've raised him up, Lord, and that he sits at your right hand, even interceding for us now. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know him, Lord, that they would be transformed today, Lord, that their hearts would be changed, that they would trust in Christ, and that they would be saved. Lord, I pray for all of us who do know you today, that we would be strengthened, Lord, to obey you better, and to look to you because of your faithfulness, because of the work that you perform for us, Lord, that we are free of sin and we can now serve you. We can serve your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.